Hi everyone, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Uh, today we will proceed to lesson 7 atomic spectroscopy. So in the first uh, six lecture, we already cover the sampling and sample preparation method for organic and inorganic compound. So starting the lesson 7 until 10, we will proceed with the instrumentation analysis. So for this time, we will look for atomic spectroscopy. Okay, in the previous lecture or in the previous lesson, we already study the sample preparation method that need to be conducted before introduce the sample into uh, an atomic absorption spectro uh, spectroscopy instrument. For example, so for solid, we can do some acid digestion method, microwave assisted uh, digestion method or dry ashing method. While for water, we just only need to filter them. Okay. So this is uh, our learning outcome for today. At the end of the lesson, I hope students should be able to describe the basic theory of atomic spectroscopy, describe the principle of and component of atomic absorption spectroscopy, describe the advantages and disadvantages of a flame atomic absorption spectroscopy, and graphite furnace atomic absorption spectroscopy. Uh, and uh, also in this lesson, I hope students will be able to describe briefly the principle and component of ICP AES, explain several application of AES and ICP AES, and finally compare the advantages of ICP AES to AES. Okay. Actually, there are various methods for the analysis of inorganic compound such as atomic spectroscopy, X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy, mass spectrometry, electrochemical approach, and chromatography. But the purpose of this present section is based on atomic absorption spectroscopy and atomic absorption spectroscopy. Remember, only two. Eh? Atomic absorption spectroscopy and another one is atomic emission spectroscopy. Before we proceed further with instrumentation, we need to go back to the basic concept of atom, basic theory of atom. I think you already learned this basic theory during your matriculation or form 5 chemistry. According to the Bohr model, the atom is made up of nucleus surrounded by electron. When an energy of the right wavelength is applied to an atom, the energy will be absorbed and the outer electron will be promoted to an excited state. Okay. Uh, I think you're quite familiar with this concept. By measuring the amount of light absorbed, a quantitative determination of element present can be met. Okay, this is because the amount of light absorbed is equal to the concentration of element in the solution. So the capability of an atom to absorb a very specific wavelength of light is utilized in atomic absorption spectroscopy. Okay, meanwhile, in atomic emission spectroscopy, the concentration of an element was equal to the photon that emitted when the atom came back from the excited state to the ground state. Since every element has a unique electronic structure, the wavelength of light emitted is a unique property of each individual element. So this property utilized in atomic emission spectroscopy such as ICP OES. Atomic uh, techniques are concerned with the amount energy uh, absorbed while atomic emission techniques are interested with the amount of photon of photon photon or light emitted. Okay, we proceed with Atomic Absorption Spectroscopy or, e, or AAS. Eh? We have this instrument in our lab, but unfortunately, you cannot have practical session due, due to this COVID-19 case. But maybe later when the situation is get back to normal, so I will show you how to, how these instruments work. Okay, this is a picture of an AAS. AAS in, is an instrumental technique for determining the concentration of particular metal element in a sample. 
we can use uh, to measure copper, cadmium, zinc, plumbum, and etc. As long as we have the lamp that provide the characteristic light for the metal. AAS can be used to analyze the concentration over 62 different metal in a solution. We can see here a few components of AAS. Uh, we have uh, HCl here. HCl here is not referred to hydrochloric acid but referred to hollow cathode lamp, the lamp that provides the characteristic wavelength. The burner head and nebulizer. Okay, as I men mentioned earlier, according to the Bohr model, an electron will jump from ground state to excited state when receive energy from an external light. In AAS, the liquid or solid sample is converted to metal vapor by using flame or graphite furnace. Okay, the atom absorb light of the same characteristic wavelength during excitation from ground state to excited state. In case of AAS, we use different light for different type of metal. If we want to measure copper, we use copper lamp as the external light source. If you want to measure nickel, so you need to use nickel lamp. The light absorbance can be used as a measuring signal known as spectrum. The intensity of the absorbance is proportional to the concentration of the element in the sample. For example, we want to measure the concentration of plumbum in water. The metal, for, the metal vapor from the plumbum absorbs the plumbum light and produce an intensity absorbance equal to the concentration of plumbum in water. So by using a standard solution, we can construct a calibration curve. Then unknown sample can be analyzed based on the calibration curve. Okay. This is the component of AAS. Okay, we have two types of AAS. The first one is flame AAS and the second one is graphite furnace. AAS. The only difference between this type of instrument is the atomizer. Okay. For flame atomic absorption spectroscopy, we use flame to atomize the sample. You can see here the combination of fuel and oxidant, acetylene and pure air, or acetylene with nitrous oxide to generate high temperature around 2500 to 2700 degrees Celsius, while graphite furnace atomic absorption spectroscopy are using graphite furnace to electrically heat the sample into an atom. Basically, we have a few components of AAS which is lamp, atomizer, monochromator, and detector. We will learn the function of each instrument one by one. Okay, for light source, there are two light to produce the light. There are two, two type of light used to produce the light with the same characteristic with metal vapor. The first one is hollow cathode lamp, HCL, and the second one is the EDL lamp, electrodeless discharge lamp. HCL contains a cathode of an light element of an 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 anode and, and are filled with a noble gas such as a uh, argon gas. When a high voltage is applied across the anode and cathode, the metal vapor in the cathode are excited into producing light with a certain emission spectrum. Meanwhile, the EDL contains the element in a small quartz tube filled with a, a noble gas. So, argon, a high frequency field led to a plasma within the tube in which the element is excited and emits specific light. Okay, so this is the picture of EDL lamp. So basically, the purpose of all this lamp is provide the characteristic wavelength, provide the light which have the same characteristic wavelength with the metal vapor or metal of analyte. Okay. So the type of HCL and EDL used is depend on the metal being analyzed. For analyzing the concentration of copper in an ore, a copper lamp would be used. Uh, and likewise, for any other metal being analyzed, the electron of atom in the flame or graphite can be promoted to higher orbital, for an instance, by absorbing a set of energy, okay, set quantity of energy. So, just like I mentioned you earlier in the principle AAS. 
The second component is atomizer. Atomizer or atomization cell is the site where the sample is introduced. So two type of atomizer, which is either flame or graphite furnace. This atomizer will cause the metal containing sample to be disassociated and liberated from a hot environment. This environment is sufficient to cause a broadening of the absorption line in the metal. So the above feature is the flame atomic absorption while the bottom one is the graphite furnace. So the atomization flame in AAS, there are three steps. Eh? Okay, actually three steps are involved in turning a liquid sample into an atomic gas in flame AAS. The first one is dissolvation where the liquid solvent is evaporated and the dry sample remain. Then number one is volatilization, the sample will rise to a gas. And finally, this is dissociation. The compound making up the sample are broken into free atom. So the flame is arranged laterally long, usually 10 cm and not deep. Okay. The height of the flame must be must also be monitored by controlling the flow of the full mixture. And a beam of light passes through the flame uh, at its longest axis, the lateral axis, and hit a detector. Okay, next we go to the nebulizer. Yeah, this nebulizer component uh, is part of flame atomic absorption spectroscopy. The function of nebulizer is to suck up the liquid uh, from the samples. Okay, and then uh, it creates a fine aerosol for introduction into flame. This also will mix aerosol with the full and oxidant and create a heterogeneous mixture. Okay, the smaller the size of the droplet produced, the higher the element sensitivity. Okay, the full here is the acetylene and the oxidant is the either compressed air or nitrous oxide. So if the mixture of acetylene with air, the temperatures of the flame can be up to 2300 degrees. Meanwhile, the mixture of acetylene and nitrous oxide, uh, can, the temperature can raise up to 2700 degrees. So you can see the picture of the as nebulizer all right so for flame atomic absorption spectroscopy there are several disadvantages uh, for example this sample only 5 to 15 percent of nebulized sample reach the flames and this uh, instrument require uh, we can say that a uh, large sample volume 0 0.5 to 1 mil is needed to give a reliable result compared to graphite only need a very small amount and then the sample which are viscous require dilution with solvent okay we proceed to the graphite furnace atomic absorption spectroscopy okay the sample is placed in a graphite furnace and electrically heated Okay. If flame are using full and oxidant, the graphite furnace are using an electrothermal atomizer system that can produce temperature as high as 3000 degree. So a beam of light passes through the tube and then will vaporize the sample into three stages. The first one is drying the sample. The second one is ashing the organic matter and finally vaporize an, uh, of an light to atom. So the advantages of graphite furnace AAS require very small samples, very little or no sample preparation is needed. Sensitivity is enhanced, so, uh, we are usually 1000 times very uh, sensitive compared to flame atomic absorption spectroscopy. And direct analysis of solutions, slurries and solid samples. So of course this instrument also have disadvantages, okay, such as uh, the analyte may be lost at the action stage. The sample may not completely atomize and the analytical range is relatively low. Okay, next we go to the monochromator. So the function of monochromator is uh, used to select a specific wavelength of light which is absorbed by the sample and to exclude other wavelengths. So we want to make sure that if we want to analyze the Cooper, only Cooper light is selected. The selection of the specific light allows the determination of specific elements. Meanwhile, the final component is the detector. So the light selected by the monochromator is directed onto the detector known as 
PMT or photo multiplier. So this PMT is, is actually convert the light signal from the monochromator into an electric signal proportion to the intensity. So the, the processing of the electric signal is fulfilled by signal amplifier. So it will increase the signal. And the signal could be displayed for readout or printed by the requested format. Alright. Finally, we can construct a calibration curve to determine the unknown concentration of an element in a solution. The instrument first, AS first, we calibrate the instrument using a several known concentration. The absorbance of each solution is measured. And then the calibration curve uh, of concentration versus absorbance is plotted. So the unknown concentration is calculated from the calibration curve. Okay, this is the sample of calibration curve here. Okay, in this study, they use a, a five a point calibration curve. The first one is zero. The second one is 100. The, the, the third one is 200. The fourth one is 300. And finally, 500 uh, ppm of the aluminium sample. So, when we construct a calibration curve, we have the straight line here. So when we want to analyze the unknown sample, so immediately we will understand, we will know the concentration of unknown sample by just using the equation from the calibration curve. All right. Example: Lead is extracted from a sample of blood, uh, give an absorbance of zero point three four in AAS. Using the following calibration curve, find the concentration of lead ion in the blood sample. So it's very easy, you just use the equation y is equal to 1.0505x. So use the equation to calculate the concentration of uh, I plumbum lead in. And then the result 0 0.357 ppm is displayed above the graph. Alright, I hope you understand how this calibration curve works. Okay, there are a few applications of AAS. Eh? Actually, we want to check the metal inside the water analysis, in the food analysis, in animal feed stuff, and also additive in lubricant or and greases, also in analysis of soil, and also analysis of heavy metal in clinical analysis such as from blood sample, whole blood, or plasma, or serums. Okay? Alright, we proceed with the inductive copper plasma atomic emission spectroscopy and inductive copper plasma mass spectrometry. Okay, there are two types of ICP. The first one is AES. AES refers to the concept of atomic emission spectroscopy. Meanwhile, ICPMS refers to mass spectrometry. So actually, ICP is a multi-element technique that dissociates the sample into atom and ion using inductively coupled plasma. Okay, there are two types. The first one is ICP AES, or also known as ICP OES, type of emission spectroscopy, and ICP MS, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. So the basic step of ICP is actually the sample is nebulized and directed to the flow of argon. Okay, the plasma torch consists of concentrate quartz tubes. Okay, the inner tube contains the sample, aerosol, aerosol and argon. Okay, the outer tube contains a flowing gas to cool the tube. A radio frequency uh, generator produces an oscillating current in, in induction coil that wrap, that wrap the, around the tube. So induction coil creates oscillating magnetic field. The magnetic field in turn set up an oscillating current in the ion and electron in the argon. So as the electron and ion collide with the atom, the temperature is increased. So the plasma will dissociate the sample into atom and ion, exciting them into a higher energy levels. They emit light at a characteristic wavelength and will be analyzed. The instrument will know the concentration of metal inside the sample using standard solutions. So I know you are not really uh, understand how the process is uh, going on. So I prepared the slide, uh, the YouTube uh, video for you to make uh, to better understand regarding this topic for ICP.
Okay. ICP MS is built up on principle of ICP OES and utilize ICP to dissociate atom from a sample. The only difference uh, is ICP MS send this atom into mass spectrometer or MS a system to separate the atom or ion based on their mass to charge ratio. So the concept of MS, please refer to the video. The mass spectrometer is a vital instrument in many kinds of chemical analysis. But how does it work? And how do we interpret the data that we get from it? A mass spectrometer works in five stages. First, the sample is vaporized. Then, it is ionized. Third, it is accelerated. Fourth, it is deflected. And fifth, it is detected. The deflection stage is the heart of the mass spectrometer. When we accelerate an ion, it would like to keep moving in a straight line. This tendency of the particle to move in a straight line, its momentum, is proportional to its mass. However, in a mass spectrometer, we use electromagnets to try to deflect the ions off their path. The amount of force that the ion feels from the electromagnet is proportional to its charge. The path that the ion actually takes is a result of its mass-charge ratio. A different particle with a different mass-charge ratio will take a different path. And this is what we are actually detecting, different mass-charge ratios. So let's analyze a sample. We vaporize it and ionize it, accelerate it, deflect it, and then detect it. We can record its mass-charge ratio. If we repeat this with more of the same sample, we will record different size fragments. Eventually, we'll know the proportions of all the different size pieces in our original sample. Okay, the comparison of AAS, ICPOES, and ICPMS. If we are using AAS only single element in PPB or PPM range only, although the system is very cheap and simple and small dynamic, graphic furnace can be 1000 times more sensitive than flame atomic absorption spectroscopy, but also more challenging. Uh, ICPOES. Uh, we can analyze multi uh, elements simultaneously in PPB range. Okay, very limited uh, spectral interference, good stability and low metric effect. Meanwhile, ICPMS also multi element possible to reach even at PPT and PPQ level. It's a very complex, most expensive, lowest detection limit, isotope analysis also possible. Okay, that's all for uh, lesson 7. I hope you understand. And we we'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.